All right, Revelation 9, 13 to 21, the sixth trumpet destruction of one-third of mankind. One-third of mankind, according to the scriptures, very specific. And we're talking about World War III, essentially, as the elder mentioned. So let's look at the scriptural passage. We'll read uh, the Greek first, and then we'll go to the uh, English and to and we'll look also at the at the Orthodox ethos. No, sorry, the Orthodox New Testament uh, version uh, last. All right, read with me in the Greek. I'll get rid of my picture. Ke o ektos angelos esalpise, ke ikusa phoni mien ekton tesaron keraton tu thisiasteriu tu krisu tu anopion tu theu. Legondos to ecto angelo, o econt in salpinga, lison tus tesseras angelos tus dede menus, epito potamo to magalo e frati. Que elithisani tesseras angeli etimas meni, istin oran, que istin imeran, que mina, que ne afton, in apoctinosi to triton ton anthropon. Και ο αριθμός των στρατευμάτων του ύπου δύο μυριάδες μυριάδων. Ήκουσε τον αριθμό αυτών και ούτως είδων τους ύπους εν την οράση και τους καθημένων σε παυτών έκοντες θώρακας πυρήνους και η ανκυνθήνος και θυώδης και η κεφαλή των ύπων ως κεφαλέ λεόντων και εκ των στομάτων αυτών εκπορεύεται η πύρ και καπνός και θείων. Από των τριών πληγών τούτων απεκτάνθησαν το τρίτον των ανθρώπων, εκ του πυρός και του καπνού και του θείου του εκπορευωμένου εκ των στομάτων αυτών. Η γάρ εξουσία των ύπων, εν το στόματι αυτών έστι εν τις ουρές αυτών. Η γάρ ουρέ αυτών όμοι όφεσιν. Έχουσε κεφαλάς και εν αυτές αντικούσι και λυπή των ανθρώπων και ουκ απεκτάνθησαν εν τις πληγές ταύτες. Ου μετανόησαν εκ των έργων των χειρών αυτών. Είναι μην προσκυνήσωση τα δαιμόνια και τα είδωλα και τα κρυσά και τα αγερά και τα χαλκά και τα λίθινα και τα ξύλινα. A ute vlepin, dinete, ute akuin, ute peripatin, kiu metanoisan ekton fonon afton, ute ekton famakion afton, ute ektis pornias afton, ute ekton klematon afton. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Ephrathis. Okay, the, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were the heads of, as, the, as the heads of lions. And out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Then we go to the Orthodox New Testament, and we'll read it and just stop 
and also talk about some of the differences. I think there's some interesting differences. Let's read. It's good to repeat the scriptures and go and consider every line as we will in a moment, step by step. And the sixth angel sounded a trumpet, and I heard the voice out of the four horns of the altar, the golden one, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, the one having the trumpet, loose the four angels, those having been bound at the river, the great Ephrates. And there were loosed the four angels, and the ones having been prepared for the hour and for the day and month and year, in order that they may kill the third part of men. And the number of the armies of the cavalry was to myriads of myriads. And I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision and those sitting on them, having fiery and hyacinthine and sulfurous breastplates. And the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths went forth fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three plagues were the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which went forth out of their mouths. For the authority of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do injure. And the rest of the men, those who were not killed by these plagues, repented not of the works of their hands, so that they should not make obeisance to the demons and the idols, the golden ones, and the silver, and the brass, and the stone, and the wooden which are neither able nor to see, nor to hear, nor to walk. And they repented not of their murders, nor of their use of drugs, potions, or spells, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Now, just to go backwards, we'll start the last por portion here. And we'll notice that we have a pretty big difference at the end here between the King James and the Orthodox New Testament. They say here, neither repented in verse 21, neither they repented they of their murders, nor their, of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. But in the Orthodox New Testament, they have drugs, potions, or spells. And in the Greek, we have, very interestingly, utoekton pharmakion afton. Pharmakion is the same word we have for pharmacy. Very interesting, isn't it? Given what we lived through the few years, last few years, and that is translated variously by uh, sorceries, which we will maintain uh, for the most part. The Elder Athanasius refers to sorceries, which of course includes spells and potions and drugs. Those are not um, mutually exclusive by any means. The sorceries include a variety of things. Uh, so one word could be sorceries, but they spell it out in the Orthodox New Testament as portion, uh, potions and spells and drugs. And it's very interesting, I think, that we could interpret it that way, with, given that we're, what we live through. Now, also, well, let's go actually to the next slide, which has it laid out. I've given this is an excerpt from the Orthodox New Testament uh, uh, notation in the back. And so we'll just go right through it because this is the easiest, quickest way to do that. Now, one of the interesting here. Uh, things here in the translation of 916, and that's a very important passage here, 916. Let's go back to the King James. We have 200,000,000, 000, right? And the Orthodox New Testament has myriads of myriads and two myriads of myriads. And so that actually is a literal translation from the Greek. It's the same word, myriades, myriadon. So that's two times 10,000 times 10,000 or 200 million, 200 million. What was that? The armies of the Calvary were to, was to 200 million. Now that's a number, as we will say again, when we get there, that is unfathomable for the ancient world. So it must have been quite an amazing thing to read in the ancient world that there are going to be 200 million soldiers in Calvary in this massive war. Uh, we have in uh, two, uh, 918, the word plagues is included and it's in the, it's in the original, but for some reason it's omitted in the King James. Uh, so it does say in 19, uh, let's see. 
where am I? I'm not seeing it for some reason here. Let me go back to the reference. Oh, 18. That's why I'm looking the wrong way. Wrong place. 18 by these three. Um, that's still not there. Why we have a misnumbering here for the powers? Of... Oh, I'm looking at King James. That's why it's not there. <laughs> that might help. So by these three plagues were the third part of men killed. And so in the King James, as I was in vain looking, by these three. Uh, but there is the word trion pligon, and that's kind of curious why they just did not translate the word plagues. We have it in the King Orthodox New Testament. Now, King James adds by ek uh, in 918b. It's not found in Constantinople, the, the text used by the Orthodox Church. Not a huge issue, but kind of curious. Uh, in 18b here, uh, by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, uh, and ectuperos, ketukapnu, ketutheo. Not a huge issue, but it is a difference. Again, a uh, uh, difference here is that, as you see here, the authority in 919, we're looking at 919 for the authority, the horses in their mouths and in their tails. Now, that's not a minor error for the King James. They have a comma there, and it's kind of set apart in the King James. Uh, and in, they've chosen to translate it as authority, although uh, the version in our um, five-volume series has it as power. It's not a huge issue. Of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. And when we get there, Father Athanasius has an interesting comment on that, that it's both, right? It's both and what that might mean in our contemporary age. Repented not. And the King James reads, yet repented not, which is not in the original. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a manuscript issue, not a big issue. And then again, we already talked about 921. So they add drugs, potions, and spells as opposed to just sorceries uh, in the King James. All right, enough with the text. Let's go to the actual interpretation and um, very uh, jump right into the sixth plague the great war and elder athanasius begins his commentary here <clears throat> with the following words this sixth plague heralded by the trumpet call of the sixth angel is much more terrible and far more destructive than the previous ones as it brings forth the second woe the main subject of this plague which is characterized by an intense eschatological dimension is a horrendous war that is totally unprecedented in history. However, it has its prelude in every epoch since all wars that take place serve as a prelude to this great, this one great and terrible war. The Lord expressed this when he said, you will see and hear wars, plural, and rumors of wars. And I want to point out here that we have this principle at work in our interpretation that is throughout the interpretation of, of Scripture, but also especially of Revelation. And that is, as you see this little symbol that I have here, this, this rolling ball on the line that goes forward to the end of history. You see on the right side of our text, I kind of drew that so you remember that we have always both and. We have it with throughout the 2,000 or how many years it is from the first to the second coming. Uh, we have uh, these events that are types of the end, and then we have the fulfillment, the final and, and uh, end uh, of history with the final war, right? So we have many wars throughout history. Some might say, well, there's been many wars. What? It, it's nothing new under the sun. And that's there's an aspect of truth to that. But it, I, it's not. That's only one half of the picture and the equation. We have wars that are types, preludes. Uh, of the final massive war. Obviously, when we're talking about 200 million, a number un unfathomable, and the, and the one third of the population of the earth, these numbers are massive that we've never lived in a war to date, right? Never lived such destruction. So clearly there is going to be something different in that final war. It's not going to be just another war. Uh, but we have these two world wars already, which have brought us 
further and further along toward the final, what could be the final World War III, what Elder Athanasius refers to as World War III. He seems to believe that the, the next war, the ma next massive world war will be the last, will be this great plague, this great war. So the world seems to be preparing for war. As we speak, we have rumors of wars, rumors of nuclear war possibly coming. We have fear of nuclear war coming. Right now in this world, we have uh, the fear and the and the many people uh, predicting, others uh, prophesying, people speaking in the Orthodox Church and outside that this uh, conflict in Ukraine could spill over, that we're going to have a conflict in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the world seems throughout the 20th century to be... Uh, the leaders of the world to be obsessed with war. Uh, and as you know, I'm sure it's not something that's a revelation to most of us. Wars are very profitable. And therefore the greed of man that has been, un, especially in this 20th century, with so much materialism in the world, greed drives men toward war again and again and again. And of course, power and uh, not just greed for money, but greed for power, right? They want to uh, they want to obtain more and more power over the world. And this is certainly behind the present march toward war. Uh, the Lord warns that not only will peace be elusive, but that there will be wars which will become progressively more catastrophic until we come to one horrific war, the epitome of all wars. The last two world wars serving as, a, as its welcome wagon, so to speak, does seem that we are preparing for this great eschatological war, which is described by the holy evangelists in such a way that it is difficult to imagine. It's difficult to imagine, indeed. Tragically, as you will see, the world today possesses all the necessary elements for this war to become a reality. This is very important. I remember uh, many times speaking to some old timers in the village in Greece, and I'd have a conversation with one of my church wardens, who was also a, a graduate of the theological school, and he would tell the story of the 1940s, before there was a television, or they wouldn't even know that there was such a thing as a television, I guess, in the village, uh, and they would just, they discussed this whole uh, uh, image in the book of Revelation, where we will see in, in shortly, where the whole world sees the slaughter of the two prophets. And he asked the teacher, how is it possible that the whole world will see the slaughter of these two prophets? And of course, the teacher was at a loss to explain how it's possible that the whole world, and he imagined something like, well, by God's you know, providence or something like this. Well, now we know, not shortly after that, the world began to have the possibility, and now it certainly has the possibility throughout the world within seconds, within minutes at the most, to see images from other parts of the world flashed across the screen throughout the entire world. Something unimaginable, not a thousand years ago, but 50, 55, 60 years ago in some parts of the world, a hundred years ago for sure, throughout the world. Uh, so this is, these are the things that uh, are are signs of the times, right? that, that we could have that fulfilled easily today, that image of the two prophets being slaughtered and shown across the world, but also that we have, as he says here, all that is necessary for this image of the great war to become a reality. Of course, nuclear war, nuclear warheads, and all of that which is at the fingertips of the leaders of this world uh, could easily uh, decimate one-third of the population of the world if God uh, God forbid we're, we're, we live to see that, uh, it is it's certainly possible. And so the fact that we've entered into the time period that it's possible uh, is a sign. Now, does it mean it will happen next year or, next, or the next five years or 10 years? No, obviously we don't, we cannot say that, but it certainly uh, is a major sign that we're getting closer and it could possibly happen uh, now with these, uh, these means that are at man's disposal. So let's just break down the scene here that we read. We've read it now in Greek, twice in English. Let's break it down a bit and just make sure we understand what we're seeing. The altar that is described in uh, the, 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 the scriptural passage, 
right? It begins by saying that I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. The altar is the vision of the holy evangelist uh, of the Ark of the Covenant. The same one, the very same one that Moses was commanded to copy accurately when he was on Mount Sinai. So this is the altar that he's talking about, the Ark of the Covenant. And then the altar also equals the golden altar of incense. So he says there, the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And the voice heard from the four horns of the altar is the voice of God. It's also the voice uh, is answering is the answer to the prayers of the saints, as we saw earlier in, in, in Revelation, uh, who the prayers that ascend to God as incense. Remember that when we discussed all that in the intercessory prayers of the saints just a few weeks ago, a month ago. And then the voice speaks to the angel that has just blown the sixth trumpet. Uh, so the voice of God is speaking to the angel that has blown the sixth trumpet, and it is... Uh, Commanding it, six, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Ephrates. Ephrates, I don't know the best way to say that. And that's very interesting. What are these four angels? What are the four angels bound at the Euphrates River? Here's an image on the left. In case you don't know where the Euphrates is, that's up there on the left. And, of course, the Tigris. And what do we remember? What happened and what was there among those Four rivers, right? The Pison and maybe the Githon. Those are all mentioned in scripture, but certainly the Tigris and Ephrates in that area, which is traditionally known to be the place of paradise mentioned in the book of Genesis. And so these are, uh, it's very interesting that this, this area is where apparently the massive war will take place in essentially contemporary Iraq. And it's the same place that we have uh, the uh, uh, paradise was a physical place, right? They actually, Adam and Eve actually stayed and walked in a physical place. It was paradise because it was, it was paradise, not because of anything per se, physical about it, but because it was communion with God. And that, that's where they had the communion with God uh, in that area. Uh, today, it's a, it's, a, it's a very problematic place. It's uh, in terms of how to live there. It's filled with all kinds of uh, insects, and it's, uh, it's not exactly a, a paradise any longer. That's not an accident, I think. But in any case, that this war will take place there is a very interesting and deep and a, mis a mystery of God's providence. Uh, and it, these the, now, what are these angels that are bound? Right, the four angels it says being loosed by divine intervention. Divine intervention looses these angels. People ask, what's going on here with this loosing of Satan at the end of time? Well, these divine these these um, angels that are being loosed are not the angels at the four corners of creation. They're not God's angels sent protect the nations. They're demons. According to Elder Athanasius, they're demons, and of course they are loosed to provoke the fierce war that will eliminate the life of one-third of the Earth's human population. Now, some people might say, well, what is this? God is bringing upon... The, God is, is, is loosing it? God is provoking it? God? No. This is all as a result of man's sin and apostasy. And somebody asked me, I think, two weeks ago, well, what... Why is it that they interpreted it in a similar way, another passage, that God was bringing about the loosing of, of the devil at the end of time? And we see in the, in the world the great spike of demonic activity in the world. How is it possible? As Father Seraphim Rose says, is walking naked throughout history. We see uh, uh, the devil walking naked throughout history. Um, so why is that? What's going on? And the answer is that we, Christians, lose the devils. We, Christians, give rights to the demons, to the devil. We, with our apostasy, we, with our worldliness, we, with our return to idolatry, we are the ones that, that allow and, and, and open the door to the demonic. And, and the formerly Christian people, right, the formerly Christian people of the West in particular, 
but all of the world that follows and has apostatized and is apostatizing, wherever that might be, following after this, uh, this civilization, which is, of course, the civilization of Cain and of Babel and of the pagan Rome and not the civilization of the Roman Empire uh, after Constantine or uh, any kind of uh, uh, divinely established uh, society, but a civilization which is turning all of its gaze earthward. And so when that happens, essentially turning away from God, what happens is we become like the demons and then we, we open ourselves up to their activity. And therefore, we are behind the loosing. God allows for it. Of course, everything's allowed by God. But ultimately, the cause is us and our apostasy. And that's what's happening at the end of time. And then the Lord said, will I find faith on the earth when I come back? Precisely because we have already uh, walked away from his commandments. And that's what's bringing about all of the destruction upon the earth. And from whatever angle that might be. Uh, it's interesting, again, the typography here. And the question is, uh, contrary to what we've seen so far in Revelation, where there's a general description and not a particular, usually a particular place that's mentioned, right? They don't give a lot of geographical places that they're mentioned. Here we have a particular geographical place, a particular topos, place on earth. And the question is, is it a literal uh, reference? Is he writing of a literal or a noetic place? All right, something in the in the realm of the noetic realm, the the uh, in the noose, the spiritual life of man. Is it Bab? Is it like Babylon? Because Babylon has ceased to exist as a city and a, and a, a physical empire, right? So Babylon is it has been since then something that we understand noetically as a state, a spiritual state, a, 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 a not a physical location. And this example of Babylon will help us understand what, how to understand possibly uh, the reference to the great river uh, Euphrates or uh, Ephrates. Uh, and so the example of the meaning uh, of Babylon, uh, the great city, the great prostitute, right? Uh, first of all, it's important to note that it did not exist when the great apostle wrote the book of Revelation, obviously. So he's not referring uh, and we're going to hear a lot about Babylon going forward. He's not referring to the actual physical location uh, of an empire or a city any longer. So it is a noetic understanding, right? A spiritual state. It could be applied to other many other things. It could be called Babylon and refer to uh, Roman Empire or to America, as, as some other contemporary Orthodox have done. America being a kind of new Babylon, right? With many religions, many gods, many... Uh, and total giving over, giving over of many people to the flesh and 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 greed and all the rest, which is the, what Babylon represents, uh, embrace of the passions. Uh, and so uh, it is. It does not exist Babylon as an empire any longer, but it exists, and it existed then as ethos, right, as a way of life and a mindset. Uh, and like Rome. Uh, which was referred to, is referred to in the book of Revelation, that prostitute which deceived the whole world, it and Babylon is not limited to a time period. So Rome, Roman Empire obviously doesn't exist. It certainly doesn't exist and ceased to exist for a long time as a pagan uh, uh, empire persecuting Christians. Uh, and so it's not limited to that time period or place. And it so it changes, it changes from nation state to an uh, to a nation to an empire and then to a ethos and mindset, and so the words of Revelation in this regard are still relevant and applicable. It would be a very grave error to say, well, there is no more Babylon, no more Roman Empire, no more. You know what 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 meaning does the river, uh, 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 the Euphrates River, have for us? These things now take on a. A, um, they're applicable, they're relevant because they take on a noetic or a an ethos or mindset and they're applicable in other places and times. Let's look at 915 now. 915 and it says the four angels were loosed which we were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year 
for to slay the third part of men. Well, this is very, very interesting. So it's very strange and and impressive. Uh, the re the reference to the to the hour, to the day, to the month, and to the year. So this is very specific here. This is going to be fulfilled in a very specific to the hour, to the day, to the month, of the year. It's going to be fulfilled and prepared for an hour, right? So this is very interesting. It's this, it's an ascending scale. It begins with the hour and goes all the way to the year. Its purpose is to show the decision of God is unalterable and final. This will happen. This will come about. This is not uh, it's not up for discussion. Uh, maybe we'll avoid this. This timely precision shows that the execution of this plague is, is exact. It's programmed to the last detail. It will come about as it's been prophesied here. Naturally, such detailed execution does not concern this plague alone. So it's, it's not just this, but this is a uh, emphasis that this is the case here. It stands true for the whole of the book of Revelation and for all the prophecies in Scripture, but it's it's stressed here that this is the case. And it says at the end of 915 that a third part of all humanity will be slain. Now, that's a that's that's a number that's just unfathomable. Think about it now. It'll be 52 times if it's in our days, if it's uh, if the world continues to grow, we have other billions, which is I don't think Elder Athanasius would think that that's likely or, pro or is going to happen. But even in our day at this time, we're talking 52 times more slaughter and death than World War II. In particular, we're talking 2.6 billion people. 2.6 billion people are expected if it's one third of the today's population of 7.8 billion, 2.6 billion people would die. Now, it's interesting just to reflect that we know it's very public and it's been going on for decades and decades. And I remember researching this back in the 80s when I was just out of, or, or let's say 90, 1990 and 91, when I was in college doing pro life work, there was a lot of literature on the uh, overpopulation uh, contingent among the the universities and the government the agencies and all the rest who really were pushing hard even then back goes back decades and decades and decades this idea that the world is grossly overpopulated and we are threatened by this population to become extinct to, to whatever their, their their various fantasies are about population explosion and its threat to the world and we know very well that there are many powerful men today who talk often about the need to decrease the population by a large percentage, down to far beyond 2.6 billion. And so there are people today, which I don't think would have been the case, again, another sign of our times, it would not have been the case 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago, that we have a, a large and powerful contingent of people who would like to see the population grossly and massively reduced. I think they would like to get it down to 1 billion or 2 billion. So that would be a 6 billion dollar uh, 6 billion sorry uh, person loss. Uh but 2.6 2.6 billion people will die in this world war 3. Uh in 916 it's very interesting here that the saint Saint John the theologian says the following and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, and I heard the number of them. It's very interesting. He says, and I heard the number of them. It says, it's, it's a stress. No, 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 I'm not making this up. I didn't just guess. I heard the number of them. Very interesting expression. I heard the number of them. In any case, it's definitely to confirm that this number is real. There will be 200 million soldiers in this war now in saint john's time i'm not sure there were 200 million people in the world i don't think there were i don't know the uh, the estimation of contemporary scientists what what would be the population back in the in the first century second century but uh i don't think so i think it would have been much less and so it's inconceivable for the vast majority of commentators on the book of revelation for the for the last 2000 years to think about this number being a literal 
number of casualties. I mean, I, they, they couldn't have imagined that number. It would have been basically wiping out. First of all, it would have been far more than a third of the population. So they, they would have to concede that there would be a, more than a third of the population was going to die, and there would be 200 million, which is larger than the population, in the war. How could that be? So this is something that it would have been very hard for people to conceive before this massive population explosion in the last few hundred years. And today we can't imagine it very easily. We have a country like China alone that could field a 200 million man army. Theoretically, they could field a two alone. They could field a 200 man, a million man army to come and to fight against the powers that be of this world. So, uh, it is, um, it's certainly possible today to imagine, although it would be an amazing, amazing thing to see and to experience, obviously it'd be amazing, uh, but we can imagine it and we can imagine those 200 million, uh, being decimated by nuclear weapons or, or something uh, to that effect. So, uh, Elder Athanasius also wants to stress uh, at one point in his interpretation that although there's horses mentioned, obviously from what we can see going on in our description of Revelation, they're not meant literally as horses. Just like we have these descriptions of these locusts that are not meant literally as locusts, but we can see that they're meant to be descriptions of something that is a mystery to the to the uh, saint, something that is beyond what he could uh, uh, describe so he calls them he, he describes them as locusts obviously they're not locusts the ones we looked at last week and here horses but no there's something much more and rather they're armored war machines according to elder athanasios uh, and we'll see that further on um so <clears throat> let's go on to 917 now and look at this 9.17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and jacinth, which is uh, meant to hear as a description of a color, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as heads of the lion, as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone so clearly we see here that there is a division of armies a division of essentially like teams they have their own colors their breastplates uh and we have essentially three different colors here we have a red a blue and a yellow and it seems like there's three camps, three armies. And what does it remind us of? Who are the red, yellow, and blue? Perhaps, perhaps it could be the yellow, the Chinese, the red, the Russians, and the blue, the Western world. These numbers, at least at this present time, do correspond some way to those people groups. It's speculation, but it's possible. And the Elder Athanasios makes that speculation. And we're also told that the heads of the horses look like heads of lions, as heads of lions. And of course, the lion is a uh, symbol of power. And they could be the modern day cavalry, which would be armored tanks. That would not be outlandish to imagine from the mouths of these idiomorphic horses issue fire and smoke and sulfur what what comes out of these uh, tanks much of the same fire and smoke and sulfur something like sulfur these three elements relate to the three colors just depicted as well i'm not sure um how the elder doesn't, doesn't elaborate but it's interesting to comment the smoke corresponds to blue and the fire to red and the sulfur to yellow okay well that's uh, beyond that, there's not a lot, but it's interesting that they correspond also to the elements in the warfare themselves. So 
uh, the smoke to blue, the fire to red, and so forth to yellow. So this is coming out uh, of their mouths, issued fire and smoke and brimstone. So we have a more description of this massive war that's going on. But by these three plagues was the third part of men killed, all right? So these three plagues. Why? What, what are these three plagues? By the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. And this is very interesting. For the authority of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do injure. So very interesting, bizarre, you know, we don't have anything, I don't think, like that in the natural order. Uh, maybe something close, but nothing really that can destroy a third of the human beings on this earth. Uh, so there's the sixth plague, but then essentially he's got three plagues now within the sixth plague. Three things that kill the third of humanity. Uh, which we differentiate between because of the three elements of fire, smoke, and sulfur. And so because of these things, the people are wiped out, a third of humanity. Uh, there are apparently three different methods by which the people will be destroyed. Where fire is mentioned, for example, this may designate those who are killed by the use of missiles or nuclear weapons. God help us. God help us. Huh? The sulfur could refer to chemical warfare used in conjunction with or to complete the work of the missiles. Also very much possible. It's not a, an accident that they found many chemical laboratories in Ukraine. That's not an accident. Chemical warfare is still very much a threat and is used, uh, they're, they're racing ahead to manipulate all of those to destroy other human beings, not only in warfare as we saw, but also in other ways. Seemingly, he is speaking about three plagues and in actuality, there's one plague with the final results obtained by three different methods. So that is 918 to 19. Let's go on and see another aspect of this. For, from everything that we have mentioned, we must understand that all the elements of this plague are possible today. Now, he stresses this several times. It is possible today for all of this to come about without much of imagination at all. It's all there. And, and we're rushing. We're rushing. As, uh, humanity is rushing toward other means and methods of destruction, of self-destruction, of, 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 uh, of decreasing the population uh sizably so we have nuclear artillery of course we have uh, armies of 200 million soldiers as we said and we have this area in the middle east which has, has been already a focus in the last 50 years quite a bit of several wars that have happened already uh and it's much of a focus today because of its oil and its strategic position and all the rest right so these things are very much before us in our day, in our life. When we take these facts into consideration, along with the description of the sixth plague, we wonder what it all means. We wonder what it all means. Well, we can we can definitely uh, not only wonder, but we can imagine quite a bit what it all means today, where it can go. Could it be that what, this is 1982, right? So 40 years ago, he's saying, before... Much of what we do experience, the fall of the curtain, Iron Curtain, the wars that have gone on since then. Could it be that we await this terrible, unprecedented confrontation with its unrivaled strategic dimensions in world history, the battle of all battles in this region of Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq? And he says, I cannot give you a definite answer. God uh, will show us in, in due time. If we go back and we look uh, at previous events in salvation history, such as the times of the pharaohs, we will have something here very much that's uh, instructive. Before we do that, though, let's read 9, 20 to 21 again. And the rest of the men... 
those who were not killed by these plagues, so the two-thirds of humanity, repented not of the works of their hands. They did not repent. Seeing such destruction, they still did not repent. So that they should not make obeisance to the demons and the idols. They didn't seek, they didn't cease worshiping at the feet of the demons and the idols. They didn't cease worshiping at the feet of the demons and the idols. Amazingly so. The idols, the golden ones, and the silver and the brass and the stone and the wooden, which are neither able to see nor to hear nor to walk, they repented not of their murders nor of their drugs and potions and spells, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. So we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about these, these aspects here of this, of this way of life of modern man, of the contemporary, uh, increasingly pagan, atheist society that we're living in. And immediately one can go back and think about, well, who did not repent and what happened to him? Well, Pharaoh, the hard-hearted Pharaoh did not repent. And he was increasingly hardened with every successive plague, just like these here in the book of Revelation did not repent, even with the sixth plague and the three in the sixth and all of the destruction that came because of the apostasy and because of the giving rights to the devil, giving rights to the demons, worshiping themselves, the idols that they've created. All of this is what brought about the plagues, and they still did not see the connection. They still did not say God's hand and his providence is allowing these things for our salvation. We need to repent. We need to come back. We need to turn away from the path of destruction. No. Just like Pharaoh, their repentance will be superficial. He was filled, filled with fear after each plague, but he did not repent. It says there in Exodus 10, 16, 17. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, I pray, only this once, only this once, and entreat the Lord our, your God only to remove this death from me. And he said similar words during each plague, and he fiend repentance. Out of fear. Well, then what happened was, what happened? He didn't repent. He went back again and again to desiring to have power over them and fearing their departure would be his perhaps fall from power or, or destruction of the country or whatever, loss of power. So we're guilty of the same kind of hypocrisy. We're guilty of the same kind of double-mindedness. We're guilty of the same kind of fear for this earthly existence, but not fear of God and not fear of eternal damnation. Uh, so when we have our struggles, our region, our, our plagues, our, our natural disasters, uh, what happens? Well, we, we, we repent. That is, we feel terrible for a while. We have remorse. We feel uh, we need to change our life. And then slowly we go back to the pit, to the vomit again, and we forget everything when there's no more danger. That's the nature of the uh, unrepentant one, right? The one who's not made a decision that he will be and submit himself to God and be repent and be obedient. As it said, they should not make obeisance, right? They should not, they didn't, they did not cease to be obedient and to, and to submit themselves to the demons in other words, to turn to God and be obedient to God. They did not do that. They did not come back to God and be obedient to him, but they continued on the path of their self-destruction, self-destructive obeisance to demons and idols. They repented not. Now, punishment alone, regardless of how harsh it may be, does not always bring about repentance if one more factor does not exist, right? We can't do it alone. Without Christ, we can do nothing. We have to call upon God for something else. And what is it? The grace of God. His assistance, his help. So people feel terrible for what they lost, but they don't turn to the, to God. They don't turn to Christ. They don't turn and understand all of this is connected to my relationship with Jesus Christ. I have to repent and go back to him. And therefore, they don't attract the grace of God. And this is something we can all learn in our own life. If we go back to the sin again and again, if you're falling into sins, 
You're falling into sexual sins, perversions, masturbations, whatever it is that you're doing that's self-destructive. The drugs of this day it could be literal drugs. It could be the sexual drugs, the highs that you get from whatever destructive behavior that you are or have been engaged in. And you go back to that pit, that vomit. Why is that? Father, I keep going to... Why? Because you don't have the grace of God. You're not humbling yourself sufficiently. You're not forcing yourself. You're not struggling enough to track the grace of God. That's certainly what's missing. We can't do it alone. We're not doing it for Christ and in Christ. We're not doing it for Christ, right? We, we just don't want to go back and, and be humiliated. We don't want to lose the feeling of being good with God or whatever it is. We have certain things that are all self-serving ultimately and don't attract the grace of God. And therefore, we go back to the pit. So it's twofold necessity for us to get out of that cycle of sin and destruction. And it's not only our personal struggle, but also our calling upon and attracting the grace of God. And this grace is present, of course, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The good disposition, the good intention, this is what's necessary. You have to have the good intention for Christ and in Christ. Although Pharaoh watched his magicians perform some poor imitations of Moses' plagues. In other words, he had he had something to, you know, he realized the poverty of his own thing, even though he was trying to, to withstand and he knew that it was impoverished. He returned to them nonetheless. He went back to the ones that couldn't produce, the ones that were poor and pathetic and, and before the power of God, still went back to them. He returned to take their counsel and how not to allow the Hebrews to take to ever leave Egypt. And so we do the same thing. We go back to those supports of our sin and look again for consolation where there is no consolation. We go back to those things which do not ultimately free us but slave us more because it's easy, cheap, and it's self-satisfying. Even though we know it's a lie, even though we know there's no power there, even though we know it's slavery, we go back, right? Just like you went back to the sham the sham of this religious, uh, this religion of the pagans of his day. He knew there was no power there. He, he was, he was not um, ultimately concerned about the truth. He didn't care about the truth of things. Right? He cared about power and the passions, serving the passions. He was enslaved. He did not believe in God. Think about that. The reason why he did not go back and submit himself to the God of Israel and allow the will of God to happen, is he didn't believe ultimately. He didn't have fear of God. He didn't trust God. He didn't believe ultimately. He saw the power, but he didn't entrust himself. The demons know and tremble at Christ, but they don't humble themselves. This is the way all those who imitate the demons are. They, everybody knows God exists down deep. We're made in the image of God. But we trample upon that. We don't want to humble ourselves. Atheism is the rise of this arrogance, this pride, this 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 luciferic self-absorption and, and egotism, right? And so they tremble, but they don't entrust. They don't humble. They don't submit. And all those who, again, follow after the demons follow the same pattern of behavior. And so most people explain a miracle, for instance, of God, like happened with Moses, or all of the providence of God, the things that happen that point to God as something coincidental, right? This is especially today when they've, they, they believe in a pathetic example and explanation of, of reality, which is the science, scientism and scientific outlook, which is with, uh, you know, the atheist, godless scientific outlook. They, they want to chalk it up to luck or coincidence, or something natural, or they even give it occultic dimensions, right? They even go to the point where they they attribute it to um, some kind of other power in the world, but not God. Don't submit by all means. Don't submit. Don't humble, and don't uh, don't draw near to God because of this luciferic pride. They did not repent of their murders, their idolatries, their sorceries, their thefts. And these four things remind us of the commandments that God had given in the Old Testament to Moses. First of all, you should have no other gods before me. So the idolatry, right? This is the opposite. So the first commandment. 
You should not make it unto yourself an idol, uh, nor any likeness of anything. This is in the heaven above, and this is in the earth below. And that is the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them, nor serve them. So idolatry and the murderous aspect of things here, um, ultimately, they, these two go together. They describe... Um, well, I guess you could also you you could also uh, maybe I'm missing one here. I don't know. Any case, the the various commandments. I think I'm could have been more complete. The the adultery and the thievery. So they specifically mentioned thievery. Do not steal is one of the commandments, and do not commit adultery, which would be the various uh, fornications and all the rest that's mentioned. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, the. Order of things is that first and foremost, everything depends on the knowledge of God and the truth of, of God, right? So that's the first and greatest commandment. The love, like the Lord says in the New Testament, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your neighbors yourself. We have, of course, no other gods and no idols. And so this is the beginning, this is the hierarchy, this is the top at the top of the list, and everything depends on this. You can have the rest without this, and you have nothing. You have to have this first, and everything follows. And so that's the same in the order of things in the church. First and foremost, we have the knowledge and the truth of God, and therefore it is it is a great lie and a product of the revela re the, the um, total destruction of the order of things and truth with relativism and nihilism of our day that they they paint a caricature of theology and this is also because of the great heresies in the west that brought about in part brought about this perception among people today that theology is a theoretical intellectual pursuit it's a scholastic pursuit it's for certain people it's like philosophy but about god this is not the case whatsoever we cannot even claim uh uh, we cannot claim to be ignorant of these things and have a spiritual life and and be and and do all the rest of the commandments. So that we cannot put aside the order of things and theology at the top. It's the greatest of all knowledge, right? Got knowledge of God. This is first and foremost, and it's because God wants us to be exclusively His, and He sa says, "You shall have no other God except Me." So man has to have and has great need at every moment because of his inclination to idolatry, he has need of every moment of having a deep and true knowledge of God. So idolatry is at the door. It's at the, uh, it's very close to every one of us. When we turn and we start to worship at our own egotistical altar and, and we make the created world uh, our our God, we worship at that and not the Lord and his will. We are we're very close. So we're constantly inclining toward that. And we constantly need to have a knowledge and a true and deep knowledge of God. And so first and foremost is the knowledge of God and the worship of God and having no other God and no idols whatsoever in between uh, ourselves and God. Now, what we have instead in our day as a sign again of the end is we have a return to the pre-incarnational state of the world. We have, we have a return, and that's another sign of the end. And this is the world will return to idolatry and is returning to idolatry very quickly. Another sign, again, of the end. So it's very important to remember what the Apostle Paul says about that world that he encountered and that he was evangelizing, because that's the world that we now are facing. And he says the following. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Think about the world we live in as you listen to this. Think about the world we live in as you listen to this. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. And therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All right. So when you, when you give yourself over to idolatry in whatever form, right, that gives yourself to the lust of their hearts and impurity, right? What, where does this lead to? What is a sign of that? What's the, what do we see the rise of in the last, I mean, a sharp rise in the last 20, 30 years in the world, the Western world at least, America, Australia, Canada, UK, Europe. We see a sharp rise, a indeed a, 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 a massive propaganda in this direction. And what he's what St. Paul says next. Listen to what he says. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. What are the dishonorable passions? Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. I'm talking about lesbianism. And the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. So the rise of all of this unnatural uh, behavior and relations, which include within marriage, let's not be deluded, the unnatural acts within marriage, the sodomy and the oral sex and all the rest is the same category. Lest we be deluded and think this is not apply to people who are engaging in these acts within marriage. It's the same category of unnatural acts that are condemned by the church, the fathers, the saints as in compatible with the love and the relationship as it's meant to be by God between a man and a wife. But how much more, obviously, when it goes beyond even the blessing of marriage, we're distorting it with these acts in marriage, but beyond that, we just we reject even this and we embrace the same sex and we uh, glorify that. This is a result of the return to idolatry. The, the sharp rise of this in this age is a return to idolatry. And so, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. The people who are supposedly presenting a Christian theology and a Christian identity and yet embracing this as natural, obviously are walking away from the Apostle Paul and have nothing to do with the Apostle Paul. They're apostates from the great apostles of the nations. They cannot reconcile what he says here with their supposedly open-minded embrace of these uh, perversions and distortions. It's amazing that they have the boldness and the darkness, unfortunately, in their intellects to turn away from the, what the Apostle Paul says about the pagan world of his day, right? So this is, if you are saying Christians can do this and be this and reconcile this to a Christian life, you are walking, not only walking away from Paul, but embracing the pagan world of his day and saying that no longer do I want to walk according to the cross in which the passions are crucified and we are liberated from the enslavement of the passions and idolatry. No, no, no. We're going to embrace that. And it is a blasphemy of the name of God among the people of the world for those who call themselves Christians and, and, and return. Let's hear the last part of Romans 1, 29, 32. He goes on. Where does it all lead? What does it all mean? And it is definitely a sign of the end of the world. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same. Listen to what he said. They know and they do it anyway. Just like the demons. The demons know who Christ is. They know the truth. They know everything. They know that their days are numbered, and they do it anyway. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Many of the things he lists we see in our society today. One of the things that is most egregious is seeing these same perverted, distorted people trying to take children away from their own parents to distort and indoctrinate them and encourage total disobedience of children to parents, 
disobedient in parents, it says, right? Inventors of evil things, drag queens with children, total distortion, perversion of the human person and, and teaching innocent children to follow in their footsteps. This lifestyle of luxury and laxity, which has been encouraged and, and celebrated in the Western world for a long time is what brings about idolatry. They're both connected. Idolatry leads to that, and that leads back to idolatry, and it is all alienation from God and a sign of the end times. Now we have the blasphemy of the gospel here. Blasphemy of the gospel. I'm sorry, I was not, uh, this was the text you should have been reading, and I was not uh, uh, showing it to you, all right? So we went there, and then we did this, and now we're here, the gospel is blasphemed when we be step when we believe we can reconcile the gospel and the life of distortion perversion that the apostle paul just described to us this is a blasphemy of the gospel here's what the elder says modern christians have gone one step beyond the ancient world so not only is it what paul described just now in romans and those who are turning away from the gospel are embracing this pagan world. No, we're going beyond that. The gospel found the ancient world living in idolatry. Today, the Christians have taken an audacious step surpassing the ancient world. From idolatry, they have made the leap to atheism. Somebody wrote to me earlier, their atheism preexisted from the time of the Western apostasy. Of course, there's always atheism in the world in the sense of it's you know rejecting God. Atheism in the ancient world meant though not having God. Atheos is somebody who is, doesn't have God. Today they they re, they reject the existence of God, which is something that is truly uh, did not exist for the most part. I mean, it was very very limited in the ancient world. Everybody believed in a God. Of course, they worshipped idol idols and themselves, but they didn't. They they paid homage to some higher being. Whereas today they have this audacity and delusion to believe there's no God whatsoever. And of course, that is a result of the apostasy of the Christians. That's, that, that is that is on our doorstep that they're arriving at that. But there are Christians today who are going even further than the ancient pagans. The phenomenon of atheism did not exist in the ancient world, as we see it today, the kind of atheism we have today. However, it certainly exists in today's world. Consequently, the world today is in a far worse condition in every previous condition, because it has denied Christ its Savior. It has denied Christ its Savior. Even denying the Master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their licentiousness, and because of them, the way of truth will be reviled. Because of them, the way of truth will be reviled. Because of who? The so-called Christians who are embracing the passions, distortions dis and of the human person in these various uh, idolatrous ways of life. The licentiousness, he says. Because of them, the way of truth will be reviled. God have mercy on them and on us all who are poor, poor Christians of the last days. God give them repentance before the end. The way of the truth is the gospel. The gospel is blasphemed by the very lifestyle of, of these many superficial Christians. God help mercy on us if we are among them. This occurs today, my friends, because we are rebelling against the living God. Disobedience to his commandments will bring about the de decomposition of our societies. Disobedience to his commandments will bring about the decomposition, the dissolution, the destruction of our societies. He's talking about Greece not talking about America, how much worse for us in the Western world where we don't have monasteries and relics and icons wonder working all around us as people in Greece can take refuge if they desire. How much worse we are. So how much more we need to go the narrow path? How much more we need to double down and, and, and pay attention unless we be swept away by the, those who are blaspheming the truth, right? The gospel. And that the way of truth is being reviled because of their behavior and their distortion. God help them and us. Now, we're going to go one by one through the four things he mentioned. What are the four things? Uh, well, not quite yet. We're going to talk about 
yes, no, the first thing is murder, right? And then we're going to go to fornication, the theft that he talks about, and the sorcery. Four things that are con are are are, are uh, described here in the scripture. At the end of the uh, of the of the passages, what does he say? They repented not of their murders, nor of their use of the drugs and the potions and the spells, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. All right. So those four things uh, that the scripture talks about here, we're going to look at them because that's what's going on in our society. Lest we lest we think that those things are not describing and and uh, they're not expressive of what we live around and in in the midst of this modern world let's just remember the the gross and massive murder of innocent children uh throughout the world today in the hundreds of millions in the hundreds of millions that have been slaughtered over the last 50 60 years uh in the sin of abortion many that are unrecorded uh, many that maybe have been killed in other ways that are not recorded. God have mercy on us uh, for the gross, uh, sick society that we live in. The mass abortion among formerly Christian people is a sign of the end times. We've never seen such a low regard for human life as we see today. We hypocritically raise our voice about animal and human rights while there, there is a daily anarchy, a rioting, hired murders, torture of Christians worldwide, murderous wars, indifference to the health and the life of millions of people, the pollution of the environment, the adulteration of food and pharmaceuticals. Interesting, he said this 40 years ago, the adulteration of food and pharmaceuticals. We are at, at levels hundreds of times worse than what he had in 1980. In Greece, in the 1980s, you could find very good food, I think, in, in, in the marketplace. Today, it's Increasingly plastic, it's genetically modified, and you know, you know all of what we're talking about. And the pharmaceuticals, all of this is a part of what he's talking about. This is a fruit of the apostasy and the idolatry, and the and the very sick and evil people uh, who are bringing about this because they're they're essentially atheists and they're serving the enemy. Uh, all of this is, he says, in the category of direct and indirect murder. Have you ever thought about that? This is a direct and indirect murder of millions of people through the various things we're just describing and much more. I mean, abortion alone uh, is in this category. Or how about the, for the fornication that goes on in the world, the return to Sodom and Gomorrah? The em embrace of the flesh today is unparalleled. Certainly, we are becoming a society of Sodom and Gomorrah. Today, I mean, what would Elder Athanasius say about this picture on your left? The satanic drag queen insanity that's going on in certain parts of the Western world. Today, we may have been, may even be ashamed to say that we do not perform the sinful acts that everyone considers normal. Today, people are ashamed to say I'm pure. Children are ashamed to say I'm a virgin, he says. Children are, people are ashamed to say I don't go around and have many different partners. You're ashamed of virtue? You're ashamed of purity, which is an achievement, which is a glorious thing to have? Lord have mercy. This evil has gotten progressively worse and is so widespread that it simply spills into the streets. How about the technology today that spreads it so quickly? He couldn't have imagined that in the 1980s. What we would have arrived at today, the technology at the fingertips of so many people today and the, the the fornication that goes on behind closed doors with the various devices. People are ashamed to say that they have not experienced immorta immorality because of the so widespread immorality that exists today. The unnatural is accepted as perfectly natural. The sinful is something fun, exciting, and completely normal. The pure, the self-controlled, the chaste, the wise, the prudent man is considered to be outside of today's reality and beyond the bounds of what is considered normal today. All of this is true. You know it's true. How much more should we take care for our children and get them out of harm's way and forget about achieving anything in this fallen, sick world, but protect their purity, protect them from the destruction that goes on? Today, increasingly, even in schools where people are struggling for virtue, you have children who have not been protected by their parents who come to the schools and are also 
creating uh, you know, similar problems for those who are trying to protect their children. It's going to such degrees and infiltrating such levels today that we have to be very, very careful to avoid it and to protect the children and make a way uh, that they can avoid all of this uh, immor immorality, which is so widespread. That's the first, this the second, rather. This is the third that is described here in the book of Revelation as characteristic of those unrepentant, even after the massive war. They're unrepentant because they're enmeshed in these sins, murder, fornication, theft, and sorcery. This is characteristic of the unrepentant after the massive third world war that is coming upon humanity. It says, it is interesting, he says, that this third point, theft, is stated in the plural. They did not repent from their thefts, plural, multiple thefts. The presence of thefts reveals the absence of love and respect in man for his fellow man, his self-gratification, lack of faith, and many other ills. Today, everyone steals. Theft has become a science. Look, you can, go to, you can go to San Francisco today, and they can steal a certain amount under a certain, uh, a certain price tag, and nobody will persecute them or prosecute them. And you can't do anything about it in certain parts of San Francisco, apparently. That's what, that's what they show us on... On, on, online today. It's amazing. Theft has become, a, as he says here, a way of life. Everyone does it. It's a science. It's unrivaled sacrilege of the day. To the point that people would even steal, it's an expression in Greek, Panagia's eyes. Today, one of the worst results of theft is that people die from hunger. Have you thought about the theft that goes on that steals from one part of the world from the other part of the world? The, third, the first world steals from the third world. And there's massive poverty and death and hunger throughout the world. In 1982, he said 17 million people will die from lack of food. 17 million will die from lack of food. A few thousand died in the Twin Towers, and all hell broke loose. But 17 million died in one year, and how many more now? How many more died from hunger? I don't know. 10 million of that number will be children, he said, in 1982. 10 million people are dying. This is the lofty theft of earthly goods controlled and withheld by the selfish interest of a few nations who extract their wealth by using other nations at the expense of the poor third world countries. One of the reasons why there are prophecies saying that America will suffer tremendous destruction on the coasts especially. There are prophecies today from elders on Mount Athos and elsewhere saying that the America will suffer greatly in the future from war and from just other natural disasters is precisely because they have been robbing America and the West has been robbing the world of natural resources, employing people from all throughout the world for nothing uh, and, and you know using them to produce their first world goods for generations, for, for the colonialism going back 100 years, more, right? At the expense of the poor, third world countries, they've been abused and people in the millions are dying because of the lack of love and the theft, according to Elder Athanasius. Now, that's very interesting because Elder Athanasius is some, not some leftist. He's not some woke guy who says we need to be against colonization. He's an elder of Monathos and he's saying, look, folks, let's be honest. And let's not be politically driven. And let's not have a fantasy about our first world righteousness. But we are part of this problem. And beyond that, of course, we've seen the devil walk naked through history, as we said earlier, and sorcery and magic and all of this and the Harry Potter phenomenon and all of that is initiating people, young children, more and more into the demonic, into the realm of the demonic, and so this is not, of course, just limited to uh, overt intentional acts of sorcery like this book you see here on the left or other many other books that have been written about Wicca and all the rest. But it's through the use, as he said, as the scripture says earlier, pharmaceuticals, spells, potions, drugs, all of this is a part of this extension of 
the demonic in the realm of uh, humanity. So there's, there's a it's a component. Sorcery sorcery is a component of the idolatrous world we live in, and a substitute for faith. Right? Instead of having trust in God, they run to the sorcerer. They run to the to the fortune teller. They run to the people who can magically tell them what's going to happen. They're going to have a good life. They're going to get into make a lot of money. People do this all the time. There's if you go down downtown of any big city, you can run into people who will tell you your future, read your palms, and it goes on and on and on, right? They're ready to believe every stupidity and all nonsense today. You can get them to believe about anything except the true God. In Egypt, back in that day, right, everything was deified. The Nile was, was a god, the crocodiles, the sun, the moon, the mice, the cats. Everything was made into a source of power to be worshipped or to be uh, made into a god except the true god, except the true god of the Israelites. That was the only one they wouldn't bow to. The same thing happens today. Today's man easily accepts anything and everything as real, even the most nonsensical and paradoxical of all uh, of ill imaginations. He accepts as reality everything except the true God in the gospel. This acceptance brought about by sorcery has led people to become demon ruled. You don't have to become possessed to become demon ruled, right? You can follow the demons without being possessed by the demons. You can become uh, a servant of the demons and all of their lies and delusions without being possessed uh, to an incredibly great extent. Never before has the world seen so many demon-driven people as we do today. I mean, these are frightening and amazing things that we're seeing here from Elder Thanasius 40, 42 years ago, 41 years ago. He was telling us that was the state of things. How much more today? And he closes this chapter and our analysis of 9, 13, 21 and the great and terrible war with the following words. My friends, the world today can be presented as the image of the paralytic of Bethsaida. Bedridden, paralyzed, and incapable of becoming well. That's the image of the world today. However, there is one difference between today's world and the paralytic of Bethsaida. He asked to become well. He repented. He wanted healing. He wanted the physician. He wanted health. He wanted freedom from sin. He wanted freedom from passions, right? This is the difference. Our modern world wishes to remain in its corruption and its unrepentant state. Give us utopia. Give us utopia as passionate, arrogant, idol-worshiping people. No God, no obedience, just utopia, please. That's the difference, right? No repentance, no return, no humility, no subjection to the truth. No love of the truth. Just give me the fruits. I don't want God. I want to be gods without God. That's the message for today. According to St. John the Evangelist, it is precisely this lack of repentance that results in the sixth plague, which will bring forth the two remaining woes. So we got more to come after the massive third world war and one third of the planet's people slaughtered, 2.6 billion if it happens today. And then when that happens, the other woes that are coming, we'll see next week. May God have mercy on us, according to Elder Athanasius. And that is that is what we're at right now in this chapter 9 of Revelation. Now, we stand continually and we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, even so, come quickly. In the midst of all of this, we're going to remain ever entreating the Lord. And that's the end of uh, Lesson 4. So of, of series three. All right, let's open it up to questions. I know we have a, a bunch of questions, so let's start. And everybody over there at Crowdcast, if you have questions, you can submit them. Uh, and let's go back uh, and start with John Anon. Father Bless, would you consider writing a beginning introduction to Orthodoxy book for inquirers and catechumens? Um, that's a very interesting proposal. I have, it's good you brought this up. So I have um, two, maybe three books right now that, that I'm putting together. Uh, most of it's from previous 
things I've done. Some of it's unpublished. A lot of it's published. We're going to collect it in two volumes for sure. I don't know if we'll get into the third. It depends how big we want to make the books. But those are forthcoming. Hopefully, I've been talking about it for six, eight months. Got a lot of other books that I want to get out. So I'm putting that on the back burner. But as far as my own books, those, those will be coming out in the next six months, I hope. One will be a collection of essays all about the church, ecclesiology, baptism, Eucharist, all these different issues that I've been dealing with for over a decade or two. Another one will be about spiritual life, the life in Christ, going deeper, repentance and all the rest from different talks I've given over the last uh, decade or so. And the book you're talking about is actually a very, very uh, interesting pr proposal. I would love to be able to do something. We're, at, we're doing more and more in this direction. We're going to do more podcasts in this direction. I think what I'll probably end up doing is that we'll do more of these. And then what we'll do is take that material that we're, we've gained over time and then we'll put it into one book and then we'll publish the book. So that's very much a possibility. If we continue to do more podcasts for inquirers and for, for catechumens, I would like to do that. So thank you for the suggestion. And maybe we, maybe my uh, head of my our publishing work can make a note of it and and include it in the to-do list, which is very long right now. Father Peter, another question. Uh, only way for me to live close to an Orthodox church is by sleeping on streets. Okay. Hard life, but I have no other option. What would you advise? I don't know what to say to that. It's very little information. If you want to write me personally uh, and, uh, and give me, you know, some... Uh, more information, we might be able to come to a better solution. Uh, that's all I can say to you. I can't really say if that's, is that, I have a hard time believing that's the only option. I believe with God's help, something better could be arranged. Uh, in any case, I would not recommend that ascetic struggle that you're talking about without a spiritual father. I would not recommend that. You need a spiritual father, a spiritual guide, someone, somewhere who you're accountable to and you're obedient to and you're listening to because that ascetic struggle you're talking about would be very difficult uh, without that guide. You could fall into delusion. You could fall into despair. You could fall into any number of problems. So I would say, first of all, let's try to avoid that. Secondly, let's talk about how that can be avoided. And then thirdly, before anything like that is engaged in, you need a spiritual father. And you're going to say, well, I'm already far away. I don't have a spiritual father. Well, that's the order of things, though. That's the order of things. We get connected to a community, and we get connected to a spiritual father. And the spiritual father may not be in that community. Maybe someone else, somewhere else. But you need somebody to guide you and help you and to discern all these things. Like, we all do. Like, no, but no one, including the saints of our church, never, you know, did not need a guide did not need someone else to be accountable to, did not need to go to confession to someone else, right? Now, that confessor or that person for very, very great saints of our church probably didn't have much to offer. But that accountability was essential, and everyone understands that in the church. Everybody's accountable to somebody, in other words, to Christ, in and through someone else. That's how God arranged it. He wants it this way. He wants us to submit to one another. He wants us to, to listen to one another. He wants us to have to bear one of those burdens, right? That's how we fulfill the law of Christ. So you need to be connected before you go and do some kind of great ascetic struggle or some kind of bold, you know, uh, 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 connection. But so if you want to reach out to me, I'll see what I can do. If I can point you in the right direction. I don't know. You have to give me more information there. Another question, John Schultz. Is there any speculation that the four angels, demons, are the fallen watchers mentioned in the book of Enoch? Any thoughts on the demons presenting themselves as extraterrestrials? I don't have anything that says that they're the fallen demons, uh, fallen watchers mentioned in the book of Enoch. No. That's an interesting thing. I never thought about it. I, didn't, I haven't seen anything in my reading. So um, that's a negative. Second, excuse me. Uh, any thoughts on the demons presenting themselves as extraterrestrials? Absolutely, 100%. That is the witness of several uh, of our contemporary uh, elders and fathers that the so-called UFOs, the so-called extraterrestrials, are not to be trusted whatsoever, not to be believed in, because they're uh, 
they're the activity of the demons, the, the demonic in the world, and uh, they are leading uh, humanity toward that kind of blind trust and 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 a, a, a way to to get people to su to, to subject themselves and to be fearful uh, and to follow after and and do the will of the demonic uh, through and uh, other people and through directly through demonic realm. So absolutely, that's the case. Uh, one second here because I've got something really annoying. So let's see. Next question. Please comment on certain prophecies attributed to modern elders, <clears throat> even to Saint Cosmas, that also talk about this war. Which ones are authentic? What are the real ones add to the picture? Well, we need to actually sit down, Fabio, and look at those. There are many. So I need to, I would need to look at those, put them on the screen and talk about them. Um, so I don't I don't think we can't do that without particular references to the to the to the prophecies. There's not just one or two. Uh, but several of these prophecies were well known to contemporary elders like Saint Paisios. He talks about them, and he, on the basis of some of them, he also, I think, talks to the people about the events to come, and and and, and is in that tradition. Uh, so that's a very huge endorsement, right, Saint Paisios. Everybody that, that I know totally trusts and embraces those as authentic. And the question is not, are they authentic? The question is how to interpret them. And many of those prophecies are pretty oblique and pretty dis difficult. You know, they're difficult to pinpoint. And I think that they will become apparent when the events happen. And before the events happen, you will not understand most of them. So they're unless you're a great God-bearing ascetic elder like Paisios or uh, others today, I don't think that you're going to easily understand how those are applied. I mean, some of them are pretty, uh, talk about it like an army will pass through on the way to Constantinople and don't, you know, don't support them or, you know, I forget the, what it says. I mean, what are you going to do with that? When it happens, you'll understand what it is. Until then, there's really nothing you can do. They just have it in mind. But beyond that, I don't think you can do much. Uh, but he does talk about, the re you know, prophecies that are interpreted as talking about the return of the Orthodox to the Asia Minor, the to Constantinople. I think I, I think that's part of what uh, Elder Athanasius, Saint, um, Saint uh, Paisius, is, is running on, uh, besides his own, you know, spiritual insight. Next question. Why wasn't there a universal position by leaders in the church regarding vaccine exemption documents based on what Father Peter addressed? The Byzantine ladybug. Thank you, Byzantine ladybug. I can't answer that. Why wasn't there a universal position? Because, unfortunately, many bishops bought into the lies of the establishment, of the vaccine industry, of the various deluded fear mongers, and they believed a lie. I mean, that's the reality. Sorry. But that's the reality. We need to repent of that believing of the lie. When are we going to wake up? How many people are going to drop dead, need to drop dead, until we as Orthodox Christians who have so much help in seeing reality through the saints and through the, and through the discernment given through the Holy Spirit, we have that at our fingertips, so to speak. When we see fear-mongering and lying and pressure to conform immediately and everyone submit on a global level, why is it hard for us to not say, whoa, wait a minute, something's fishy here. This is not the work of God. Immediately that should put us on alert and we should have said, don't go this way. We don't need to go this way. At least as, as shepherds of the flock, we should have said, I'm not going to endorse it. At least that. that. I have no business endorsing this. I have no business embracing it and telling everybody to follow after me in my example that we saw bishops and I thought very good bishops. I mean, God help us. I don't know what happened to them. Putting a needle, uh, uh, you know, uh, going and, and becoming, you know, naked up to their arm and taking their cassock off and all this ridiculous show 
and putting a needle into themselves to show that they're virtuous. It was it was virtue signaling. Unbelievable, you know. And then, so you had that reality among many bishops and, and clergy around the world. And so how could there possibly be a universal position by leaders in the church regarding vaccine exemptions when they were pressing people to take the vaccine? And then there were other bishops who were forbidding the exemption to be issued. Despicable behavior, unbelievable behavior on the part of those bishops. How could you possibly deprive people of their free will and, and, and not support them in, in avoiding a vaccine? On what basis? As if that vaccine, I mean, it, it was known that that vaccine is not going to is not going to protect you from getting it and giving it. That was very very quickly understood. So, on what basis could you forbid people to be exempt? There are people who need to be exempt for other reasons, even if you believe the vaccine was a, was beneficial. Anyway, we've been through this. This is old news. Why you're asking it now? I don't understand. The reality is, we have each person is depends on their spiritual condition how much they uh, you know we're all on the path of repentance there's no guarantee because you're a bishop or a priest or a theologian you're going to have divine enlightenment there's no guarantee we don't have automatic sanctity like the pope does when he sits on the throne immediately he he's protected from error dogmatic error you know and he will never make a mistake in terms of dogmatic error in terms of pronouncing if he pronounces it's it's automatically infallibly the teaching of the church this kind of idea is not only foreign it's it's um, it's it's an overturning of what we understand the spiritual life and the presuppositions of holiness and all of that this conciliar nature of the church and all the rest we don't have that in the orthodox church right we don't we're not papal protestants we're not we don't follow after that there is an increasing amount of papal protestantism in the orthodox church to be sure I've talked about this. I did an interview recently for a Greek uh, podcast in which I talked about the rise of papalism in the Orthodox Church. And I think that's part of what happened with COVIDism is that we just, there were too many people who said, whatever the bishop says, as if these issues are the purview of the bishop to begin with. Why is he even involved in this? Why is it on the one hand they were saying, don't get involved in decisions that have to do with vaccines. This is not a theological, spiritual issue. That's what they were saying to those who were against it. And they turned around and said, no, 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 you need to take the vaccine. Oh, we can't have it both ways, right? And yet they were doing that. There was all kinds of bishops doing that. We don't have that kind of idea in the Orthodox Church. And those people who preach blind obedience at all let alone on secondary and tertiary issues, which are not dogmatic, they're way off the Orthodox ethos. That's not the Orthodox ethos. We don't have that in the Orthodox Church. That's not Protestantism, what I'm talking about. That's not, what we're talking about here is not Protestantism. They fear that it is, perhaps, and they preach blind obedience. These are two extremes. The narrow royal path is neither. Neither individualism with no reference and no obedience and no, and no, uh, uh, um, subjection to spiritual authority. That is Protestantism. That is an individualism that is sick. Neither is it a blind obedience, though. No presuppositions. There are presuppositions for all of us in every position in the church that have to be met. And first and foremost, faithfulness to Christ. That's why and how I'm faithful to Christ when I'm obedient to the one who's faithful to Christ. Then I, I'm a part of this whole, uh, let's say, pyramid or, or hierarchy that brings me to Christ. That's the way it works. And God set that up. God desires that. Christ desires that for us, that through and in the church and through and in the priest and the bishop, we will be obedient to him. Absolutely. The presupposition is that they are obedient to him. And of course, on matters that are relevant and pertinent to the spiritual life and the guidance of the, of the people of God, not on everything. They themselves will tell you, well, I'm not a doctor, right? That's what they said. Of course, this wasn't a medical issue alone. And so there should have been an intervention, as you rightly say, on the part of the hierarchy in the direction of rejecting all of these, uh, all this pressure and worldliness and, and mindset of the world that crept in, right? And this blind obedience to, the, to, to an untested and unapproved vaccine, which still has not been passed through the the, the, the um, proper channels 
to be approved still is on an emergency a basis or, or 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 something to that effect. Anyway, we're off topic. This is not a topic for tonight, but thank you for the question. What role do Jews play in the attack on Christian values? Well, insofar as they reject Christ, I think that that would be accurate, right? Jews don't accept Christ. They don't embrace him as the Messiah. And so their role is pretty clear that they are going to be a part of undermining Christian values. If you don't submit yourself to Christ, Christian values are not going to be what you are promoting living by, right? So uh, insofar as they're involved in all, uh, I mean, that's their stance. They're going to be involved in those elements in society, most likely, that are pushing anti-Christian values. I don't think that's a revolutionary thing to think or say. It's pretty logical, right? Um I, but beyond that, speculating about where, how, and when they are in society is probably not all that profitable. You can make your own judgment and do your own research to figure out that. I don't think that's necessarily super profitable. Be on guard against anyone who's preaching, teaching, and undermining Christ and Christian values. It doesn't matter who they are. Uh, who has the key of, da of David? Dale Jackson asking. Simon Peter, powers to loose and to bind, I key knowledge, not essential. What's the question? The rest of your comment is, is oblique to me. Simon Peter, powers to loose and to bind, okay, i.e. the key knowledge, the key knowledge, and then you say not essential. What is that? What do you want to say there? I don't know. But you need to ask a more co coherent and complete question. Give me some more information, what you're actually looking for. And I'm happy to try to answer the question. Uh, the powers of bind and loose are not given only to Peter, obviously. He's given to all the apostles. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to do an exegesis right now of that, of that scriptural passage. How can we reach atheists who may attend an Orthodox service and are given a poor impression because many Orthodox parishes in America appear to want to hold on to Protestant baggage? Well, that's an interesting question. But why is an atheist... It's interesting you're talking about an atheist who comes and he's he's repelled by Orthodox who are hanging on to Protestant baggage. That's interesting. Why why would he be repelled necessarily by that Protestant baggage? Um, I I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Obviously, the Orthodox need to get rid of the Protestant baggage, and uh, and and consciously so. You got to work at it, right? You got to divest yourself of Protestant baggage. And realize just how far we are. I think the more, here's a sign somebody's going deeper. The more they go deeper, the more real, they realize how much baggage they have. If you don't think you have Protestant baggage, you have not gone deep. Protestant baggage, papal Protestant baggage, worldly baggage, whatever it is, baggage from the life outside of the life in Christ, outside of the grace of God, outside of the lives of the saints. If you're not reading the lives of the saints, you're not having the mirror of Christ throughout the ages before you, you will not come to self-knowledge. You will not understand the baggage you're, you're carrying and that you need to get rid of it. The biggest problem with orthodoxy in America, in my estimation, is that that mirror is not there. That example, that image is not put before all of us continually. And therefore, we have this, we're in a kind of uh, daze, a kind of fog that it's okay the way we live our orthodoxy. We're, we've arrived. We're okay. We don't need to go deeper. We don't need something else. We like our emeridoxy, and and we're 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 at home with it. That kind of that kind of uh, lack of good uneasiness on the part of the orthodox is spiritually very dangerous, if not spiritual death. Right? You each one of us should be consciously uneasy in a good way, as Elder Paisius and Paisius says, right? Be uneasy about what? About our own state of things. Like, how how are we? How are we doing? Are we, are we, are we making advancements? Are we doing well? And how do we, how do we gauge that? How do we uh, measure that? There's a way. It's the examples of the saints, the teachings and writings of the saints, and of scripture, of course, first and foremost, but throughout church history, we have the gospel in action in the persons and persons of the saints, Christ himself living in and through all of the saints. And that those examples and images and mirror 
is what allows us to come to self-knowledge and then for to then then to double down on where we need to make progress. So I would say that's the answer to throwing off all that baggage and making a way for all those atheists out there to come to the church. Um, but uh, uh, there's also the other side of this, and that is that some people come to the church looking for ways to reject it, looking, and they, they might not even say it or even realize it, but they're instinctively kicking because they don't want to have to start to deny themselves. They don't want to have to submit themselves. They don't want to have to humble themselves. They're afraid. They don't have trust. They don't have security. They're very insecure. People are very insecure today, right? And they're hanging on to whatever they think is going to keep them going and keep them secure. And a lot of that is their is their own formed beliefs. Like that's, you know, I, this is what I believe. And this is me. And it's all about you know, me. And so they don't want to let go of that egotistical way of thinking and living. And so they're searching for examples and reasons not to submit to Christ and not to become Orthodox and not to go deeper. So that also could be at work there, uh, Orthodox phronesis, and not simply the excuse of uh, the, the lack of uh, Orthodox spiritual life uh, among America, American Orthodoxy. Another question from Hunter. Father Peter, I am learning a few languages, one of them being Mandarin. Very interesting. I know a blessing from my priest and bishop would be needed, but I would like to translate Orthodox works into Mandarin. Would I need a spiritual father also? You all need a spiritual father. Every single Orthodox Christian needs a spiritual father. Absolutely. Now, again, let me explain something, because in the Western world, especially where Orthodox are minority and there's far and few between in some places, you, your spiritual father may or may not be somebody you have next to you or in your parish. It might be somebody far away. You might have to take refuge in them on a on a and only on big questions. Go to them once or twice a year in a monastery somewhere, for instance, for confession, and go locally to confession to somebody else. That's not at all uncommon. It's a solution for many people. So many people say, "I don't have a spiritual father." Well, they think that the they have to have a spiritual father that's right next to them in one or two or three parishes. And they go to those parishes, they don't really connect with the priest for whatever reason. And then they say, I don't have a spiritual father, I give up. But that's not that's not the whole, you got to keep going, find somebody, doesn't matter who or where they are, it could be in England, I don't know. But you could, you could get them to guide you on big questions and locally go to confession and they can guide you. Now, that's not the ideal at all, but it's a solution if you can't find a better one locally. You need a spiritual father and you need blessings. The church talks about the apostles, right? And ero apostoli in Greek is holy mission, right? It, the word apostle is somebody who's sent. So missionary work translated into Mandarin presupposes you're in the church and being commissioned by the church to do the work you're doing. Now, if there are people in the church who refuse to support that, that's a problem, and I don't know if I would say you have to listen to that. Now, do they have to bless you at this moment? Maybe not. Would, if they're just opposed to it, generally, that's a problem. If they say, look, for this reason, for you right now, not a good idea, wait, you should listen, be obedient, absolutely. If there's a spiritual dimension to this, then you need to listen and be obedient. But generally, you, the church should send you and bless you, and you should work together with the church. could be the local church in Hong Kong, I don't know, but you've got to work together with the church. Don't this is we don't have like freelance, independent, autonomous uh, work in the church. There's people who have spiritual fathers. They're guided by their spiritual fathers, and in the in the context of a parish or a monastery, uh, they're working out their salvation. That's how it works in Orthodoxy. Uh, Given, again, that there are many anomalies today because of the historical circumstances, and we work uh, as much as we can, uh, you know, with those. And it might be a very strange situation, but at least we're making the attempt to listen and to be obedient and to be sent by the church to do the work. I think it's important, and God will bless that obedience. He'll bless that desire. All right, thank you very much from KB, who gave us a donation. We're very grateful every time, of course. That helps the work. We see our Christian faith being mocked like the few examples given. How do we know when we should speak out and defend our faith? I feel like we are always told to be quiet and pray on it. So again, 
KB, you're in a spiritual relationship. You have a spiritual father and you're guided by that spiritual father and he's going to guide you. The default situation, the default position is to defend the faith as far as I, I understand and, and, and am concerned. There are reasons why one might not do that. There are t There's always need for discernment and there's a need for a particular discernment, not only in terms of am I able and, and, and uh, ready for the responsibility and the and the and the uh, challenge that will come when I confess the faith? That's one question. Is it the time right now in this particular place with these particular people to speak up? Will it bring fruit or will it? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that need that need to be answered. They can't be answered, you know, in a always in a general way. Like we apply all of the principles to particular circumstances and situations, and we work out our salvation with great fear and trembling and discernment in time and space in a particular place, right? But we we can't, if we're constantly saying quiet, pray, quiet, pray, that's a problem. If we're constantly speaking, 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 and there's no time for silence, that's a problem, right? There's a time for silence. There's a time for confession. It's not always... I'm going to speak out, and it's not always I'm going to be silent. The, those are two extremes. So like you said, if it's constantly don't speak, don't talk, then I think that's a problem. If you, for some reason, your spiritual father says you're not, the way you speak out is really problematic, well, I don't know. Maybe you need to examine that. Maybe you're, the way you're doing it is not is not well. I'm not saying you personally, but the, anyone, any one of us. We have to do it according to Christ and in the way of Christ. So there may be a need for a time where we go deeper, and then when we do speak, we have the alati, we have the the the, um, the salt, right? And then it, and then it it finds uh, fertile ground and it brings forth fruit. Uh, so so there's you see how there's a variety of things that go into this, but um, another another aspect of this to understand what's going on, the Lord doesn't say when you confess me before men. That's not the right translation of that text. He says, when you confess in me before men, any me in Greek, what is that all about? Well, the Father said that means that you live in him and you have experience of him. He lives in you like Christ, like the Apostle Paul says, I, not I, but Christ who lives in me. So the confession first and foremost of Christ is in within, right? It's, it's, a, it's a living out and, a, and Christ is working in and through us. It's that communion and union and that that synergy that happens first internally and then externally so he doesn't say go around talking 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 say my name stand up before the powers of the world speak boldly and he, he says he says that too but he says this which is like a presupposition for the other thing right in me you must confess in me in other words i threw you to the world you live in me i live in you and then and then the witness is given and Christ is seen. Very, very interesting. I'm lost on the English speaking audience because of the translation misses it. Uh, Behold the Assyrian asks a question. I finally had a meeting with an EO priest in regards to converting from the Church of the East. Congratulations. Glory to be God. After a long conversation, he advised me to not convert. Lord have mercy. And to stay put, uh, you need to write me. I'm happy to help you. Write me, team at orthodoxethos.com, and I will we'll, we'll discuss this. I have no idea what he's talking about and why he would say that. I can't imagine it. Uh, but maybe there's some extenuating circumstance when he's saying that's the case for the time being. It may be, again, I don't know who this priest is, I don't know who you're talking to, but it may be that he is deluded, that he's confused. He's an ecumenist. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And you should not listen to him whatsoever. I, I can't imagine why anybody would say, if I'm understanding you correctly, Church of the East is the Nestorian, continuation of the Nestorian confession of faith. Is that correct? That's usually what the Church of the East is referred to. It's from Iraq area, uh, not a huge church, pretty small from what I understand. In any case, can you imagine in the fifth century somebody coming from the Nestorians to the Orthodox and the priest turn around saying you should stay where you where you are? 
for that matter, from the Monophysites or any other sect, uh, um, heretical group that has been spawned over the church history, of course the church is going to embrace a return, the returning uh, brother uh, to the faith. I mean, it's it's only in the time of, in, in the age of ecumenism when you hear stuff like this and you just scratch your head and say, what is going on? I don't know. So write me and I'm happy to do what I can to assist you. Ben Briggs, God bless you and all that you do. Thank you very much, Ben. I have been seeking orthodoxy, but my family is not for it. Any advice? I have been praying and waiting patiently, but any further advice? Um, you are not the first, and you will not be the last. In fact, many, many of my fellow travelers in the 1990s, I remember when I became orthodox in 1992, uh, not a few were the only one in their family becoming Orthodox. And it was a struggle and it was difficult. And they had they had to not only be patient, but be very persistent. And so I would say to you uh, that you need to continue to make advances in every way that you possibly can. Uh, I don't know your situation. I don't know your age. I don't know any of that. So I, to give you particular advice, you'd have to give me a lot more information uh, than just my family's against me. Are you 15? And that's why you're saying you can't move ahead. That's an understandable situation. Uh, so you may have to be more patient than, than, than insistent. I understand that. Uh, but I think if, if you've written me before, I remember somebody wrote me, they were in their 15-ish, 16 age, maybe even younger. And I think I advised them to do everything possible without creating an open war with your parents or family. Do a, Pray fervently for them to be enlightened, but go deeper in every way you can through online, through reading, uh, you know, and, and preparing yourself to enter the Orthodox Church. Determined that you will enter the Orthodox Church with God's help. You will, with God's help, become a catechumen as soon as possible. God seeing your desire, God seeing your zeal and love for him and the truth, he will assist you. He will open the door. There's no question about it. There's no doubt about it. It might take a month longer than you think or a year longer than you think. I don't know. But time is not the most important thing. It's the stance. It's the stance that you keep. It's the inner stance that you keep. Faithfulness and love toward Jesus Christ and his church and the truth of the gospel. That is the most important thing. So you might be a catechumen for three or five or ten years. There, there are cases where people, um, God forbid that it takes so long, but uh, there, there's uh, saints who were, who were novices in monasteries for over ten years. Ten years as a novice. That's not a short. Usually it's three, four years, right? So these things are not, you can't put them in a box and say it has to be now, it has to be in six months, six years. These things can't be. It's in God's providence. We have to trust. But as, again, I would do everything I can without an open warfare to go and continue the path. And, um, and again, if, if you want to write me and other people want to write me and, and I can try to give you more particulars, you need to give me a lot more particulars. Unfortunately, I have to say also many people are writing me today. I have many emails that are unanswered still. So be patient because uh, it's very, uh, it's very much... Um, I mean, it's good news, right? People are people are reaching out to, and they want to become Orthodox. It's wonderful. It's just going to have to be a little patient because there's not uh, there's only so much time in the day. Uh, next question, Ivana Lakic. Father Peter, thank you for the wonderful videos. If, if it's not beyond the scope of this video, can you explain how to know if your repentance is sincere and strong enough in the eyes of God? Well, uh, our repentance ultimately is never strong enough and never uh, sincere enough. So let's just put that on the table and realize we're all lacking in repentance. But what is it? What does it mean to repent? I think if we just understand what it means to repent, we're going to have an answer for your question. First of all, repentance is reorientation to Christ. So everything you heard about tonight, what is it? We saw there's an orientation to the world, to the passions, to the created world to the false idols and all the right? There's an orientation among the people who are refused to repent even after a massive third world war. So that orientation, that disposition, that that inner disposition and, and intention is so, so important, right? That's, that's what we bring to the table. 
So when we reorient ourselves, we turn away from the world and we turn to Christ and we go and we and we desire him and him alone and worship at his footstool and him alone, the, the Holy Trinities, then we're on the path of repentance. Then we're returning. Then we've gotten up from the pigsty and we're walking back to the Father's embrace. Then we're in the Father's embrace and we're going into the house to celebrate in eternally, right? That's the whole process of reorient and return is what repentance is all about. So are you on that? Are you reorienting in everything? Are you going deeper in your self-knowledge, right? To see yourself. That's a sign of repentance. The fruits of repentance are the virtues, self-knowledge, uh, enlightenment as to the truth of the gospel, boldness and in, in, in courage. All the fruits, if you're on the path of repentance, these things are going to start to bring, are going to be brought forth out of you, right? If you are, are not on the path, it's, it's very pretty straightforward, right? The fruit of repentance is virtue. The fruit of unrepentance, of disorientation, is sin, is delusion, is the passions. So are you making progress? How do you know? Well, you have before you the mirror the gospel and the saints. You will know. Read their writings, read their lives, read the scriptures continually. God will show you. He will put that mirror before you and you'll say, oh, you know what? Uh, I need to write this down before I go to bed tonight. I was this, this, and this today. I did X, Y, Z. I need to repent of that. I need to go and turn away from that. I need to reorient myself to the opposite of that. I was angry. I was, I was uh, jealous. Uh, I was thinking evil thoughts of my brother. I was judging my brother. You, 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 once you start to have self-knowledge, you start to observe yourself, you're going to see how much I'm repenting on the path, return, imitation, right? And then if you're in the church, you've been baptized, you've been given a clean slate as, as it pertains to the image. And now you're on this whole process of return and repentance is going from the image to the likeness. The likeness is being like Christ, being God's by grace, being glorified, being illumined. That's the ultimate end of everything we do in the church. That's healing. That's salvation. To be totally like Christ. So he is the he is the image in the mirror, right? But it's just shown forth in many different places and ways. Uh, directly, experientially, through the saints, through the scriptures, through the lives of uh, the writings of the saints through the life of the church. All of that is like one mirror with uh, or many mirrors, rather, with one image, Christ. We look and we see, oh, I'm missing here. I'm missing there. I need to go deeper here. And all of that is a lifelong process. So I think you can start to realize, OK, am I on the path? Am I, am I making progress? What's going on? Right. Uh, how much do we weep for our sins? Do we have tears ever? Do we have compunction at least? Do we have contrition? Do, do, do we have regret at least? Now, regret is not repentance, right? People regret and they, and they don't change. So, But it, regret is going to be a natural thing. If we do something uh, that, that is contrary to God's commandments and our conscience accuses us, we're going to have regret, remorse. It's not enough, but it's going to be there. Uh, it's got to lead then to change. Repentance is change. Are you changing? Then you're on the path of repentance. Changing in a sense becoming like Christ. Another question from Hemiskil, or Hemiskil, I'm not sure how you say that. How can we inspire that good uneasiness with our heterodox brethren, say family, without being preachy or aggressive? Is it even our duty to begin with? Is this philotimo or pride? Interesting question. That's a very good question. Thank you very much. Let me just check and see. We have a couple questions over at... Crowdcast. I wish I could go over to my brothers and sisters over at Orthodox Ethos um, and see if they have questions. If they don't, uh, if they have questions, they can submit it via YouTube. Uh, just go over to YouTube and pop that in. If you're on another platform, you want to ask a question. Maybe you're on uh, uh, Twitter. If you're on Twitter right now and you want to ask a question, jump over to YouTube, go in the questions and, and put at Panos could could. Costuros, right? Panos, just put at Panos and ask your question. We're down to the last three questions for the night. So anybody who wants to ask a question, they need to get it in quick. So the question here is a good question. 
the question is, is it our duty and is it our business to try to increase the good uneasiness in our brothers and sisters around us who are not orthodox? Yes, but not in a preachy way, not in an aggressive way, and not with pride. Okay, so that's key. So, so yes, but in a very subtle and loving way and in, in, in a time that God reveals to us, right? Uh, and that is Philotimo. Philotimo is desiring the better and the more and the and, and the, the best rather for our brothers and sisters to do to outdo them in love and goodness, to struggle for their benefit always. So certainly their benefit is to come to Christ and come to the church. But the way we go about that has to be in the utmost humility. If it's going to be the way Christ, I am the way, right? If it's going to be the way of Christ in Christ. It's going to be in the utmost humility. So first and foremost, are we praying fervently for our brothers and sisters in our family and our friends? Is there Are they in our prayers? Not just to name them and say, God, help them. Okay, sure. But with compunction and contrition for this, their sake, do we understand that we're an obstacle to their return to God because of our lack of virtue and progress? If we were truly glorified, deified, illumined, if we had made progress, we have to say to ourselves, they would see Christ in us and they would be drawn in spite of us to Christ who's in us, right? If we're Orthodox Christians, obviously, we're talking about people who are in the church, struggling, making progress in the spiritual life. So we we have to stand in prayer with that, cogn being cognizant of our responsibility for their lack, all right? And that that humility has to be constant, continually before us. And so when we go to them and, they, and we see they're, that they're being belligerent or they're being angry or they're being blasphemous or whatever it is that they're doing on whatever level that is not consonant with the gospel, instead of judging them and saying, oh, my brother is you know, doing X, Y, Z or whatever, we should actually say it's because he doesn't see Christ in me. I'm I'm an obstacle to his coming to Christ. God help me to go deeper. So that stance is super important. Now, when God allows, providence allows, and you have an opening, and you'll you'll understand when that is, right? There'll be a discussion, there'll be an uh, an event, there'll be something which will be somewhat natural. It doesn't have to be it shouldn't be forced, but it'll be available. You can take that step without it being forced and pushy. Do it. Take the step. You might have a conversation and someone say something about something. And you could say, well, you know what the Orthodox Church says about that? Or you know what Christ said? Or you know what the saints said? Or you know my, my experience I had, et cetera. Right? And you put that in. And that's it. You don't go beyond that unless they want. You don't push, push, push. You just offer, right? Put it out there and they have to do what they, they have to want it. Pray that they want it. Pray that you can do it in a way that's going to be appealing and attractive. Um, if they push back against you and don't want you to be orthodox and live, that's a different story, right? We don't we don't play we don't have to play that game. We don't have to go there unless we're like a fifteen year old, and that's a different question. But no, but if they're if they're just indifferent, they go about their lives, and they're not interested, you're not going to go and say, yeah, you need to be interested. You know, I mean, maybe in some relationships we have that kind of real closeness and real boldness. And there's humility and an openness, and you know that they're deep down, even though they're antagonistic, deep down they're gonna there's a desire. I mean, it, it, it's it depends on the personality, but for the most part, that's not the case, right? We're not dealing with people like that usually. So you've got to wait for God, open the door, put your two cents in, say your prayers, give your good defense if it's if it's called for, get let them know the hope that's in you, and leave it to God. And 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 do time right because things take a long time. Some people take it; it takes six months. Some people take six years. Some people take sixty years. There's no time frame for someone to come closer to Christ and embrace the church. Uh, it's it, it's all uh, depending on their disposition. All right, two questions over in Crowdcast, and if I don't, I'll come back to YouTube and and Facebook in a minute. And if people want to ask, we'll we'll entertain those. But otherwise, we're going to be wrapping up. Father Bless, what is the difference between demon-possessed and demon-ruled? Constantina. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Constantina, for that 
uh, question. Demon possesses when you actually have opened up on some level and the demon has entered in. And as it were, if you can imagine, you have a house with many rooms, the demon takes over one of the rooms of the soul and he dwells there. And he actually is able to, to basically make you like a marinette, right? Marinette, is that a marinetta? How do you say that in, I forget the word. But you, he plays you. He's, he, 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 he actually, you actually lose an element of control. And that is by God's uh, allowance for some you know, reason only God knows. Uh, perhaps we have given many rights to the devil. Maybe we have many sins. I don't know. It depends. But in any case, that's possession. And that that could that's why exorcisms are read, and and there's a whole regiment of exorcists in the Orthodox Church who read and deal with these demonic possessions. Uh, so I would say that that is more rare today, although it happens. Of course, there are cases like that for sure, but it's more rare because it doesn't. He doesn't need to do that as much because people voluntarily follow. They voluntarily embrace, right? So why would he need to possess them? If he's doing their will, the demons don't need to go and, and waste their time. And so demon ruled means that they're literally like we, we're trying to be ruled by the commandments of God. Like that's the rule, the reign of God within us. They're ruled by the passions. They're ruled by demonically inspired thoughts, judgmentalness, and all the rest. They're ruled by these things. They, they live for them. They live to like a drug they're like they're enslaved to it right and they 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 live to be uh angry and jealous and these things they embrace they don't fight them they're ruled by their passions that's the deep behind the passions is the demonic is are the demons and so that would be demon ruled right you don't have to be possessed to do the will of the demons you can voluntarily do it if you want and there are people who do that a lot more than we think because they live for the passions. Anastasia has a question. <clears throat> One second. Uh, oh, this is a comment, not a question. I found a bookstore in Australia. And Apostle Paul Booster, yes, very good. In Sydney, I know it. I've been there. Thank God. Good people. That stock, stocks un come out and press books. In, indeed. They've sent, they've ordered it from us, and we sent it to them. It also sells the companies allow us translated books on Revelation. So there you go. Those people in Australia who want to buy Uncommon Press books or buy the series by Elder Athanasius by Zalalis, Constantine Zalalis, the five volumes that we're talking about on the Book of Revelation, right? Uh, you can go to the ApostlePaulBookstore.org.au. Apostle Paul Bookstore, one word. .org.au, and if you're in Sydney, you can go drop by their store, and you can get those books. Alexandra has a question. Father, as you spoke about the demons treating us as marinettes, does the Holy Spirit work that way with us, with anyone? No, the Holy Spirit does not work that way. God forbid. Totally and 100% respects the freedom of human beings, never pressures, never pushes, is extremely sensitive, and very philotimo. And you have to want very, very much to be with God. He will never push. He'll never push. He offers, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross, he says. All those who want to be my disciples, osipisti, as we say in Greek, is right? So, there you go. That's how God is. He does not. That's, that's a sign of the demonic. And that's why I told you during the COVID nonsense, every Orthodox priest and bishop and theologian and Christian should have seen all of those marks of the demonic. Pressure, fear mongering, all that is demonic. That's how the demons work. Should have said, this is something very problematic, very wrong, what's going on in the world. I the fact that we didn't know that, it's like ABCs of the spiritual life. That's how the demons work. So I'm very, very sad that even today there are many who do not understand the errors we made, shutting down churches, introducing innovations, double spoons, all this stuff. They need to repent. We need to repent. We need to come back, reorient ourselves, and understand this was a major error, a major fall. And that we bought into it, and we followed it, and we did 
obedience to that whole agenda and that whole mentality is a fall. And we need to repent. Otherwise, worse things will come. It's very, very important that this message gets out. It's been, we've been, you know, we published the book a year ago, uh, Let No One Fear Death. It's all about this. You can read it and read my article in that and this points it out. All right, last question. I'm a, I'm a Protestant, but I'm interested in what con converting to orthodoxy. My knowledge comes from online only. I want to join the church, but what are the steps toward conversion? Well, you need to go to an Orthodox church. You need to visit an Orthodox church. It, the incarnation presupposes that in, in space and time, in a particular place, you will meet Christ. You will meet Christ in a community, in the Eucharist, in the Eucharistic assembly, among the brothers and sisters, under the obedience to Christ, through and in his church. That's how you must enter into communion with him in, in a particular time and space. The internet is wonderful for teaching. Beyond that, life has to be li lived in a community. So you need to visit, find a church. Maybe if there's four or five in your area, I don't know where you are, but if there are many, I would visit a number of them before I made any decision. I would see where I can find the most serious, most traditional, most, most uh, you know, you have to just take your time and, and little by little, Learn more about orthodoxy. Don't rush. Do not run to become orthodox. It take, takes time. Every good thing takes time and effort, right? Of course, the more you struggle, the quicker you might be able to go. I'm not saying that it's not, you, know, you have to take time, but usually it takes time and you need time to divest from the world and invest with Christ. You need time to change your way of thinking, acquire the mind of Christ, all these things. It's a process. Now, again, the more zeal, according to knowledge, not zeal without knowledge, but according to knowledge you have, of course, you can make more progress. But it needs to be under someone, spiritual direction, someone who's themselves made much progress that can show you the path. Today we have, unfortunately, heresies of ecumenism. We have the heresies of, uh, you know, the various isms of the world today secularism, all these things are affecting people all around the world, including Orthodox Christians. So you have to you have to understand that that yes, uh, you you need to discern eventually to be a part of a church where they're 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 being faithful to the holy tradition. And I I can't really get into the details of that except that time will tell and 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 continue to educate and continue to learn and over time you will understand. That's why you don't want to rush and jump into something too quickly. All right. All right. I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. I appreciate your patience. Tomorrow, I'm sorry, on Thursday, we'll be together. Question and answer session through our, our Patreon page, our Crowdcast uh, platform. Uh, and then on Friday, God willing, we'll have a podcast here. I haven't really decided what we're going to talk on yet. There's a couple options. Uh, maybe talk about the fast. Maybe talk again to our all of our inquirers because we didn't get to all the questions in the last, last session. Uh, but Friday at 5 p.m. West Coast, 8 p.m., we'll be back again on another, another podcast. You'll, I'll announce that shortly, tomorrow probably. Thursday, we'll see you. Next Tuesday, our next uh, session, we're going into Chapter 10, Revelation 10. And we'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. God bless you. Good evening. And God help us. We'll uh, chant as usual. Uh, the Treparian uh, of, to our Lord and the Holy Cross, and then we'll uh, say good night. All right. So, son, kiri et on la on su, kev lo gison, ting piro no mi an su, ni kans ni van si lem si, Tata barbaron dorumenos, que don son filaton, via tu stavrusu politema. With the prayers of our Holy Father, Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. <laughs>
There we go.